Spiritual Care Association. Please join us on April 12th through the 14th at the Caring for the Human Spirit Conference and Westberg International Symposium. Uh, experience cutting edge topics to enhance your spiritual care practice at the premier spiritual care forum. This inspirational and transformative three day conference is designed to provide spiritual providers, including hospice specialists, with the skills, best practices, and research that can advance their career and improve optimal care for those in need. To learn more, please visit www.spiritualcare.org forward slash conference and register today. Now, hello everybody. I am Dr. Charles James Parker, the director of hospice division for the Spiritual Care Association. I have the privilege of serving as a chaplain and bereavement coordinator for the Traditions Health Biloxi Hospice in Mississippi. And I'm honored to be the moderator for today's event. A very heartfelt welcome to everyone in attendance and to those that were not able to join us live. Many thanks to you for taking time to view this conversation. Now, today's topic is entitled Spiritual Care Officers, Advocating for Spiritual Care Leadership and Hospice. And before we get started, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel for today's talking presentation. First, we have Captain Ken Thomas, Reverend Kenneth Ken Martin Thomas Jr. is uh, a graduate from the University of Southern Mississippi with a bachelor, a bachelor's in science in office administration. Uh, he graduated from there in 2007. In May of 2009, he earned a master's degree in theology. Uh, um, in May 2015, he earned a master's degree in divinity from Liberty University School of Divinity in Lynchburg, Virginia. And in December 2019, he graduated from Regent University in Virginia Beach with a master's of organizational leadership. Now, Ken has served as a lead pastor at New Hebron Baptist Church Carrier, Mississippi since January of 2010. Ken preaches and teaches to a growing congregation of over 100 members during weekly Sunday service. He leads weekly small groups focused on building relationships, establishing disciples, and impacting the community through practical, practical expressions of the gospel. Ken has been employed as a chaplain for Forest General Hospice and Asbury Hospice House, which is a unit of Forest General Hospital in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He's been there since August of 2016. Ken is responsible for providing spiritual care and resources for hospice patients and their families and works closely with local faith communities and serves as a liaison to community faith leaders in providing spiritual support and education on hospice and palliative care matters. Now, Reverend Ken enlisted in February 2017 into the Mississippi Air National Guard and he was then commissioned and appointed the rank of captain in January 2018. Ken is the 172nd mission support group chaplain and assigned to the 172nd airlift wing in Jackson, Mississippi. And he's coming to us today from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where he lives with his wife of 12 years, Rita, and their daughters, uh, Kennedy and Kenley. Next, we have Chaplain C. Brandon Brewer. Reverend Brewer is the director of patient experience at Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care in Maryland. He also leads the NHPCO Spiritual Caregiver Steering Committee and provides mo monthly conversations um, on hospice and palliative care with those professionals nationwide. His ministry career stands, spans at, at, at least 21 years with over 16 years of chaplaincy experience and nearly 10 years of hospice and end of life care experience. Brandon has worked to enhance chaplaincy practice and the coordination of spiritual care services and company encompassing chaplain productivity, documentation, outcome oriented chaplaincy, evidence based best practices in spiritual care, and much, much more. Brandon has participated in collaborative 
professional research and numerous, numerous presentations specific to cultural ethics, inclusion, uh, utilization, and spiritual considerations at end of life. Brandon has served congregations in pastoral care, education, and youth ministry. In addition, he has provided spiritual care in hospitals, served as a community college adjunct faculty member, and as a guest lecturer for local, regional, and national conferences. Reverend Brewer is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, USA, and a graduate of the University of South Alabama, where he learned to, earned a Bachelor's of Science, a graduate of Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, where he earned a Master's in Divinity. And he took the time to go into the CSU Institute of Palliative Care in San Marcos, California, where he earned Palliative Care Chaplaincy Specialty Certificate and he is a certified end of life specialist. He is currently working toward the completion of a, a doctorate in ministry for, from the Gardner Webb University. And Brandon, Brandon lives in Annapolis, Maryland with his family. And last but not least, certainly not least, we have Dina Perla Portnar. Dina Perla is the senior editor of the Risk and Compliance Platform Europe. She comes to us today from Amsterdam. Also, she is an accomplished speaker and the author of the biography Exodus from Lighthouse, Shadow Behind and Face Towards the Sun, and the guide Living Gracefulness. She speaks and writes about what she calls living gracefully, namely about corporate spirituality, integrity, mind building, and personal growth. Not only the knowledge and tools are her badges of honor, but also the many themes of her personal life. Dina Perlup teaches and holds the space for others with frame results as a consequence. Now, Dina Perla's experience is vast, which includes global PR, marketing, and communication director and spokeswoman press officer, a technical strategist and implementer with an emphasis on external communication reputation management, crisis communication. Her versatility is apparent as she integrates her knowledge of different languages into practice, namely Dutch, French, English, and German. Dina Perla works within different industries that include IT tech, finance, managing, consulting, energy, oil, gas, government, and of course, healthcare. She has a massive global network of media relations influences and that and analysts, along with being a well-regarded speaker and teacher on personal growth. She is an advocate for chief spiritual officers with inst within institutions of all sorts. She has fostered conversations by writing such titles as chief spiritual officers, deep thinkers we need, and why organizations need a chief spiritual officer. So this is our panel. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And with gratitude and humility, welcome to each of you for being here today. Um, let's go ahead and get our screens turned on so everybody can see. All right. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. All right, it is good to see you all. And I know Mr. Brandon, you're on the, uh, uh, always on the go. And uh, <laughs> Ms. Ms. Dana Perla, you are doing big things. I see you sitting behind the great desk. And uh, and, and and Kenneth, I know that you were- And you know who's the typewriter? <laughs> that's, <Nice>. that's awesome. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Excellent. All right, folks. Well, I got to tell you, it is it is truly an honor. Um, you all are uh, are experts in your respective fields, and so, you know, with gratitude and humility, I want to welcome each of you for being here today. And thank you for for taking time to engage in this very important topic. You know, um, everyone out there, please give a cyber clap of hands to our distinguished panel here. <laughs> Uh, you know, try to make this as 
as close to home as possible. All right, so, so folks, as you can see, you know, we have a wide range of experience with us today. And for those in attendance, as we go forward, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat section or the Q&A. Um, and we'll address them either during or after the panel uh, has spoken on, on various points, okay? So let's get started. Um, in, in 2015, Reverend Eric Hall, president and CEO of the Healthcare Chaplaincy Network, he made this statement in the Caring for the Human Spirit magazine. He said, quote, I'm all for the emergence of the, of the chief experience officer, but I'd like to see the chief spiritual officer or CSO in the C-suite of every healthcare system. This person, a board certified healthcare chaplain should fill this, the empty chair. Everyone else at the table needs input from this person because total patient care and improving the patient experience encompasses complete healing, body, mind, and spirit, end quote. So today, right, we, we're close to a year of, of having been in the midst of a global crisis as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I feel that now more than ever, spiritual care delivery is important. And across the world, you know, we know that leadership exists in, in many hospitals, corporate settings, but as a hospice chaplain, I've not seen spiritual care specialists represented at the senior levels of organizations, namely the C-suite that uh, Reverend Hall quoted. In fact, I can only name one. Um, so I'd like to dive right into this discussion with that in mind and, and see, see how we can get those, those empty chairs filled. You know, I know we can't solve the world's problems in one conversation, but we can at least get the conversation going. And, and give our audience something to walk away with and chew on. So now all the questions that are directed, that are coming up are directed to all panel members. So please, you know, feel free to speak on them accordingly. But uh, since I introduced Dina Pearl uh, last, I, I would like to get you to kind of get us going if you would. And so my, my question is what, what has been your experience with spiritual care leadership in respective organizations? and and, and can you see the value in hospice and, and palliative care organizations? Thank you. And it's an honor and a privilege to be part of this panel. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody from Amsterdam. Yeah, so the reason why we were, why I'm on this panel while we're having this discussion is that I'm a, a true believer of chief spiritual officers, but not just in hospice. Obviously, today we're going to talk about that setting in particular. However, chief spiritual officers, in my opinion, should be part of any C-suite. It doesn't matter, even in the corporate world. And that is, we have a way to go. Let's put it this way. If we look at LinkedIn, for example, to make it very, you know, tangible and even a bit funny, if you would type in chief spiritual officer via LinkedIn, how many results would you get? Maybe 50, maximum 60? Have a look. Try it out just after our, our, our talk. Right. So literally the chief spiritual officer is crucial, obviously, in, in, in the hospice uh, setting, but also in other organizations. Why? It, we have a lot to say about it. But to sum it up, it's somebody who knows about spiritual backgrounds, who knows about integrity who looks at different choices within organizations, different situations, different people, and so on and so forth, with you know, a specific lens, looking at situations that are coming up in the near future. For example, in the introduction, you also mentioned that I work for IT tech companies, right? And we have a lot going on when it comes to uh, algorithms, the use of it and um, even racial discrimination through algorithms. And, um, you know, uh, choices such as if we talk about smart cities, 
they call it in-car connectivity, right? Smart cars driving in the streets. Um, for example, if a small girl of five years old, you know, just cross the street and there would be a situation, an accidental situation, who would get the blame? Uh, what are we talking about legally speaking? And also, if somebody is in a car driving to an appointment where he or she can close a deal of five million, I'm just making it up, right? The setting. What are we talking about? What choices will be made? You know, what is the setting? Obviously, this is a very far off uh, uh, example that I'm using. More close to, let's say, to the hospice setting that we will be talking about today, it's much more about psychology, it's about humanism, it's about personal touch, it's about meaning, it's about, um, you know, consoling, it's about peace, it's about many, many things that have to do with interhuman connection, which is crucial. It's, a, it's a, one of the backbone, let's say, of such an organization. But then again, you know, my weird perspective this evening for me here and then for you uh, this afternoon and then, you know, people who will look at this video whenever uh, will be to also sometimes zoom out and show you, yes, we need chief spiritual officer. This is where we're at, it, you know, globally within all the different countries. Also, we need it in the business world. We need it in the corporate world. We need it in those organizations to really focus on on risk and on integrity um and yes that's what i'm you know that's what my work is all about thank you dina that that, that is a lot brandon what are your thoughts yes uh and thank you dina so much for that um one of the things that i would like to emphasize uh as it relates to a, a chief spiritual officer is i think that role is at the crux of patient experience as well as employee experience, uh, simply because, particularly as you mentioned earlier, Charles, we've, we're a year into uh, a global crisis, a global pandemic, and recognizing the people who are on the front lines, the people who are exhausted, the people who are dealing with these issues and concerns on a daily basis, it doesn't just go away, even when we feel like, oh, things are, are clear. The, the damage, so to speak, has already been done, and we really need to set forth a pathway to ensure that we are providing the best spiritual care for our employees in addition to our patients and families so that we can empower them to then go forth and continue providing that excellent care. And so I really see that role as the crux of sort of bridging both of those areas while also having an arm into uh, every single facet of um, hospice, you know, everything from, you know, business development. There needs to be that element of really meeting people's needs uh, culturally, spiritually. Um, and so having that, um, that role where there's at the very least consulting from each of those departments, in addition to having direct hands-on um, responsibility and oversight, particularly, again, in patient and employee experience, um, I think that's what's really going to move the needle and move things forward um, so that we can have a more uh, conducive environment to promote healing and to promote healthy pathways um, for people to go about the care that they provide and the care that they receive. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and bo both of you have touched on, on a number of different issues and we can delve into that a little bit deeper too as we go forward but i want to get your thoughts kenneth what, where are you at with this uh well dina i certainly love uh, that that title chief spiritual officer uh being in the air force uh we have that for most bases which is called the wing chaplain and the wing chaplain uh is the principal authority and advocate for spiritual care of the lives of airmen. Uh, I, I look at it in the civilian sector and, and, and in to particularly in healthcare, that sometimes the chaplain is looked at as a volunteer, uh, not as a professional in, in his field, uh, but rather someone from the community that can feel uh, this role. So I feel like the first step has to be we have to change the perception of how the chaplain is viewed and look at the chaplain as a person with a particular set of skills and education uh, and, and experience with insight to provide uh, not only just to the patient experience, but also uh, for our employees. Our, uh, in healthcare, our employees certainly feel mental drain. 
uh, for taking care of, of patients day in and day out. And in hospice with end of life care, uh, I know that weighs uh, paramount upon our uh, staff members. And so I think we have to uh, raise uh, the bar when it comes to what we think of a chaplain and not as just uh, a random religious leader, but someone who has a particular set of skills for this field. Yes. I agree. And if I could just jump in and add to that, um, I think that is so important. And we as chaplains have to be willing to do the work to elevate the role as well. Um, because there is that perception and, you know, I think there's a common, you know, set of stereotypes out there that, you know, the chaplain is there to proselytize, say a prayer, shake right. a hand, read a scripture and, you know, pat everyone on the head and walk out the door. And people are not necessarily aware of the clinical interventions, but as chaplains, we have to shy away from being afraid of saying we are clinicians and what the responsibility that goes along with that. Um, and I think that's so important for us to remember in order to elevate that role, we have to be able to live into that and understand what it is that we do and help to translate that to others as well. Absolutely. I think you touched on something really, really important, Brandon, because a lot of people think a chief spiritual officer is somebody who is you know, uh, familiar with the religious works only, whereas that is so not the case. Um, it's about psychological and spiritual methods, about tools, about um, uh, literally things that you can do in, in, in a moment, whether it would be indeed on the side of the patient, whether it would be for your own employees, whether it would be in a completely different setting in a corporate world, it doesn't matter. It's about different basic principles that can be used. For example, in my case, my own influence, let's say my background is, uh, my father is a Kabbalist. He's a well-known uh, teacher in Kabbalah. His name is Michael Portner. So uh, Kabbalah is a very big influence there. And then there's another system as well, for example, A Course in Miracles, right? So those two systems are of major influence and those are spiritual systems. But then there are massive amounts of, of, of you know, uh, current writers, speakers in the psychological field, uh, people that you would even see, you know, at, uh, at Oprah's uh, round tables, right? Uh, so a lot of famous people that, you know, work in psychology or that are part of some true media that give summits, beautiful summits on all kinds of, you know, uh, matters and so on. And in the end, that's the whole thing. So when it comes to the hospice setting, right, it's, it's, Part of, uh, you know, the task would be to educate, obviously, but it's if people would have the awareness of, okay, uh, this person is, you know, uh, an advocate of religious system only, um, then it's less of an issue, for example, than in the corporate world, right? In a corporate world, a lot of people, especially also in the Netherlands, when they even hear, the, you know, the word spirit, spirituality, they run off. They think, oh my goodness, it has to do with religion. It has to do with dogma. It has, it has nothing to do with our setting within the corporate world and the business world, right? Which is absolutely not the case because obviously in a working environment, you need IQ, right? The knowledge, you need um, uh, everything that has to do with intelligence. Then you need EQ because you need to connect with others because you can be you know, the most perfect, most intelligent, most, you know, talented uh, uh, professional uh, there can be, but if you don't connect with others, if you don't have empathy, company, all uh, compassion, all of these, you know, elements, then there's nothing to it. Um, so you need EQ. And then let's say the overall kind of helicopter, is, you know, uh, and connecting IQ and EQ would be SQ, right? And SQ is what is you know, what, what our topic is today, SQ has to do with meaning, it has to do with purpose, it has to do with why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we, you know, because we're evolving, no matter what, we're continuing, right, day after day, but it's why, what are we doing? Why, are, what does it even make sense? And then coming back to the hospice setting, indeed, um, it's about educating, it's about having these conversations that we have this, today this is this is absolutely magnificent i'm so happy to be part of this and then it's also um uh, you know being sure that people know about these basic principles whatever form whatever tools whatever method where they even come from in the end that is what's being used literally 
with the people. And so everything, I, I co-sign on everything that is said. I want to go a little bit deeper because what we're talking about and what is said has been spoken of for a long time, right? This conversation about uh, leadership advocacy, it, it's not new, but I think what, what has happened is we've spent a lot of time as chaplains uh, in healthcare as a whole, jumping up and down and saying, we are important, we are important, hear us. But where we need to go now, based on what we have transformed into as, as clinicians, as professionals, and no longer do we need to jump up and down because now we're in a position to educate. And that's what it boils down to. We have to be willing to uh, not just take our seat at the table and, and show up, but we have to be able to educate those around us that are making decisions in policy, making decisions about wellness in the culture. All of those things are fundamentally important. Yeah. Uh, Charles, and, I, and I, I think one thing that's going to really help uh, uh, chaplains is, is building those relationships with those key people. Uh, sometimes we we feel like we, we have to be in the field and we don't want to be in the office, but I, I think we're uh, neglecting uh, these key uh, moments that we can be endearing ourselves, uh, not just as religious practitioners, uh, but also uh, people who are in touch uh, with the heart of the organization, uh, knowing the well-being of, of what is actually happening on the ground and being able to translate that uh, to those senior leaders uh, who are not on the ground, but they need that data and they need honest uh, uh, data back from the field. And, and, and so the chaplain, you know, to me serves really as, as the best neutral party, the person that doesn't have his own agenda, but, but rather is looking at the organization well-being as a whole and for advancement. And, uh, and, and so like in the military, the, the wing chaplain serves that wing commander, the, the commanders, uh, the religious aspect, uh, it is his, but he entrusts that to his wing uh, chaplain and, and, and they have a great, they have to build a rapport. So whenever I get to a new duty assignment or if I have a new commander, my first primary responsibility is I need to build a rapport with my commander uh, because my success is going to depend upon the relationship that I have. And so I often wonder, are, are we out there uh, building these relationships with key uh, administrators? And, and we, we know how these things work. And of course, if we've uh, served in congregations, uh, like Brandon, uh, Brandon, you know, we know how these things work. We know the people that we have to build relationships with. And it, it is not for our own glory, but we understand it is for the mission. That, that we are so passionate about making sure that our, our patients and our employees in our organization is getting the very best. So I think that's where we need to be the cheerleader and the advocate uh, for spiritual care within our organizations. I if I could just uh, jump in and add to that, I'm so sorry, <laughs> because uh, Kenneth, you made two really good um, points that I wanted to just kind of expound upon, data and relationships. And I think one of the things that we have traditionally shied away from as chaplains and as spiritual caregivers is evidence-based practice. And, you know, we, we think or others sort of perceive what we do as nebulous and ethereal. And sometimes we have to come to the table with data. We have to go into the field and show them this is actually how patients and families benefit. These are the numbers of people who benefit. And if we compare it to those who did not receive spiritual care or support from a chaplain, then that gives us some bargaining chips. That helps us to understand this is what the numbers look like. And we're building those relationships at the same time, because a big part of that give and take, a big part of that relationship is building the trust. And so we have to do the work to build that trust that says, these are the numbers that reflect the work that we are doing, and we also want to make sure that we have a seat at the table because everyone else is bringing numbers. And if we're not bringing numbers like everyone else, how will we be considered equals at the table? How will we, you know, we'll continue to, as Charles said, jump up and down and say we're important, but we have to show that in every aspect, in every way that we can, 
And sometimes it has to mirror that of other disciplines that already have a seat at the table. And Brenda, that's because we have to speak their language and, and we have yep. to know what is important to that CFO, to that CEO, uh, to those uh, VPs uh, in the healthcare system. We have to know, hey, this is what matters to them. And there is a way that we can bring those metrics um, to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to the, that leadership level and say, this is what we're doing and this is how it's making a difference. And, and as I was thinking that in, you know, for, for, medi for, for hospice in America, uh, I wonder if it wasn't for the requirement that Medicare has, would chaplains be really considered a necessity? I, I wonder how many hospice agencies really would go out there and reach for a chaplain if it wasn't for the fact that Medicare, the biggest provider and payer, would, did not have that requirement. And, mm. and you know, so, and, so and that, that, that is absolutely a, a fantastic point because in all honesty, we're talking about legislation and the driving force of CMS that really dictates who's important, who's not. And so mm. hence the reason why you have a chief spiritual officer, someone who's sitting on committees, someone who's advocating, talking with legislators, talking with uh, CMS themselves, and, and really proposing uh, the questions and the issues that are relevant because the majority of those folks that are making those decisions are not chaplains, right? right. And, and I love, I love what uh, was, just, was just posted Thomas Seegers, she says, uh, chaplains need to stop being hurt when they are misunderstood, but rather see misunderstanding as an opportunity to educate and inform. So oh. that, uh, that means educating about how, how Medicare is influencing what's happening on the ground, how CMS is in, in, impacting that. And we need to be able to communicate that in a respectful and intelligent way. And all of you bring that all together. Um, I want to shift for a second because th this is really good, and and I know we have a block of time that we're working with, and we could probably stay here all day. But there, there's this. There was a a, a recent uh, a recent publication by the Institute of of Healthcare Improvement, and they put out a guide to promoting healthcare workforce well-being, and I found this fascinating because in it, they recommend the creation of a new position called Chief Wellness Officer with a mandate to oversee, prioritize, and coordinate system-wide efforts to improve workforce well-being. Now, with that in mind, do you think this definition of chief wellness officer is aligned with, with the CSO uh, position that we're talking about? And why, why not? What, what do you think your definition of a CSO is in this case? And anybody jump right on you. <laughs> You know, Charles, I, I can certainly see uh, this wellness officer being a component of the uh, spiritual officer. Again, you know, in my military background, that is part of uh, my work is to assess the well-being and wellness of airmen because one of the things that we worry about in the military is suicides. And there is certainly a high level of, of suicides within the military and this issue. Uh, and chaplains are on the forefront of trying to be solutions uh, to that um, uh, epidemic that we see happening uh, with troops. So again, that it's a wellness, it's a wellness matter. And, and I, I think that the spiritual officer is more than capable um, of being able to incorporate uh, that, that component. And I think when you're looking, when I'm looking at uh, my definition of a chief spiritual officer, uh, I'm trying to make it as, as broad enough without limiting the scope, because oftentimes when we start limiting the scope of the chaplain, then we're pigeonholed. Uh, and, we, and we work ourselves out of opportunities in the organization because we're saying, well, you know, I'm only supposed to be doing this, or I'm only supposed to be doing that, instead of opening ourselves an opportunity to ingratiate ourselves to others and, and say, hey, this is more, I can do a lot more than what you think mm -hmm. I can, but I need those opportunities. And sometimes instead of waiting for the opportunity, we do have to just knock the door down. And, and really create our own opportunities. And I think with the wellness officer, that would be a great component of a chief spiritual officer. Yes. I agree. And, uh, oh, go ahead, Dina. No, no, uh, go. <laughs> well, um, what I was gonna say is with, um, with the chief wellness officer, I really wanna know 
how wellness is being defined. Uh, and, and yes. you know, you, you sort of gave the description that they've provided. And I really like that. And I think absolutely. Um, but we really need to advocate for the spiritual, because sometimes when, you know, I, we all have our biases, right? When I think of wellness, I'm thinking physical fitness in the gym, you know, like doing things to, you know, really work the body. But with thinking about it from a, a spiritual perspective, I'm thinking of a holistic approach. And so I don't want to get sort of pigeonholed with certain terminology that may not be accessible to, to all. And I think you know, utilizing that language in a healthcare system of um, spiritual, you know, I think that's what we need to emphasize. You know, we're moving away from sort of this notion of religiosity, but then sometimes, you know, wellness can fall under other departments in, in ways in which they kind of get buried and don't see the light of day and have a very specific niche or a specific focus. And I want that holistic approach you know, so I would just I would just interchange those those terms and kind of switch those out uh, and and really make a um, I love what Kenneth said. You know, we just kind of break down the door and say, yeah, we we understand the concept of a chief wellness officer, but it really needs to be a chief spiritual officer, and this is why. Absolutely, I hundred percent agree. And I think you know the only thing to add here is that obviously it depends on. Uh, as somebody, the person, the inv individual taking on a role, because indeed wellness, I my connotation as well is a lot of uh, you know bodybuilding, taking care of yourself, healthy foods, a lot of knowledge when it comes to literally your healthcare. But then what we're going for obviously is also another component, which is mind building, right? Mind building, and. There is so much behind it, and it has all to do with humanism. It has to do with being in a broader sense, with so many disciplines. It's not just one discipline. It's not, you know, like this, this little box, and this is it. And it's also pretty much, let's say, in some regards, a new role. Um, another version that I heard is the chief happiness officer, which is uh, similar to the wellness officer, and it's, it's used, let's say, also in the Netherlands a lot. And there are, there obviously, there is overlap in between, you know, a lot of things. Um, you know, if somebody thinks of spirituality as just mindfulness, for example, you know, that's also you know, you could even go in the spiritual realm, let's say, and have just one layer, one little step of, you know, uh, let's say a very accessible step of, of, of what spirituality means. So what I'm thinking of when it comes to chief spirituality officer is tailor-made. What is necessary in the situation? And yes, obviously, a chief spiritual officer needs to be a really, really strong person. And also, uh, you know, integrity should be really big part of the role and whether it, how it forms whatever discipline we're talking about that's you know that's secondary and coming back also to what you said and how it's organized in the u.s it reminded me of how it's organized in the netherlands i think you're even one step ahead of us in the sense of that a, a sort of chapter the chief spiritual officer is provided in, in you know in in some regards whereas in the netherlands it's not Right. So if you would look at the hospice area, if you would look at uh, people in general, there are, you know, your clinicians, there are your, your physicians, there are the psychologists or even, you know, um, clinical psychologists and so on. And then sort of, you know, a chaplain, a chief spiritual officer in a hospice or in a healthcare environment or wherever, it's not mandatory. It's not provided in general. Yes, some do it but definitely not all. Um, same in, in healthcare as well. Uh, and it's definitely in current times, let's put it this way. I think, uh, yes, making it tangible as in metrics, right? We talked about it previously, uh, to really have these discussions, to show the data, what it does and so on and so forth. That's one part of it that's really, really important. Another part of it would be to tell those stories, more the qualitative side of things. And storytelling in the basic forms you know obviously i'm a storyteller as, as you understand so there's that um and i think that part needs to be much stronger because there's nothing nothing like you know a, a family that has 
uh, that, that benefits from chief spiritual officer and has a very specific case, or there's nothing like um, this patient who is, you know, living the, the terrible moments in, in the last days of, of his life, for example. Um, and having those stories out there and making it more human, making it more tangible in a different way as well. Very good point. You know, what came up for me as you were talking to Perla was the fact that, you know, there is a fundamental difference between hospice chaplaincy and healthcare chaplaincy as a whole in a hospital setting, right? Uh, many of us went through the acute care, went through uh, you know, ED, ICU, NICU, and made our way through palliative care, um, and then moved into hospice, right? And so what that tells me is that it, there's a story, like you mentioned, associated with why you become a hospice chaplain, right? And that story continues to be written as you progress through the ranks, right? And so by the time you're talking with senior leadership, you have this wealth of experience and a multitude of stories that you could present to folks that have, you know, started out as, 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 as LPNs, worked their way up to executive directors and then up to chief operating officers and so on and so on. And there's almost a camaraderie associated with those stories. Um, and, and I think we have to be careful too in that the, the other difference in hospice chaplaincy and healthcare chaplaincy is that the vast majority of health hospice chaplains are local clergy, all right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we can't, we can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, local clergy has, has value, right? Having the connection to the community, it has value. Um, all of us that have, have served as pastors, we know what that looks like. And so we have to be careful as we do move into uh, inter interacting at that particular level, not to lose sight of, of what really got us to this point to begin with. And how do we encourage those that have been in leadership for over 30 some odd years as a lead pastor, how can we encourage them to translate into being a professional chaplain and utilize those skills at a C-suite level? Um, and, and all of those things kind of play a part in that story. Um, but I'm wondering too, also, you know, what, what would the qualifications be in your, in y'all's opinion for, for a CSO? What does that look like to you? Um, Charles, one thing, uh, you know, outside of just being a uh, person that has a religious background, this person's going to have to have great organizational, and I'm talking about on the strategic level, uh, a skill set. Um, this person will have to think big picture. And, and oftentimes we, we as clergy may, may think more silo based, but this is gonna to have to be a big person, uh, a big picture person who is looking at five to 10 years down, who is actually mapping out a plan uh, in the organization and, and, and not only just for themselves, but they're, but they're also, hey, policy, planning, recruitment, uh, education, all of these things uh, should be a part of who that chief spiritual officer is. And then I, you know, and, and then I would say, this is the person that should work very closely to that CEO or the president or whoever is running that healthcare system. This should be a person that they see on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. And I think um, I wanna go back to something that Dina said earlier. Uh, emotional intelligence, EQ. I mm -hmm. think that is a crucial aspect of the role, uh, in addition to the organizational skills. And I think working together with the other persons in the C-suite to build a culture of inclusion, build a culture mm -hmm. of wellness, you know, from a spiritual and other um, perspective, you know, building things, you know, really kind of bringing people together and sort of showing um, those areas of commonality, but also sort of where we're going, you know, and I think all of that has to be done in conjunction with the other leaders. And you cannot leave out that emotional intelligence piece. You cannot leave out that being able to connect and interact with other people. Communication, very, very, very crucial. 
uh, in this role and helping people feel like they are heard, they are understood, they're being advocated for, that they're being cared for personally as a employee, but then also outside of that, you know, are, are they being compensated appropriately? I think all of those items are on the table when you're talking about the chief spiritual officer, particularly uh, in concert with the other um, C-suite uh, level leaders. Yes, sure, for sure. And maybe in addition to that, or uh, stressing one thing that you just said, Brendan, which is connecting with others. Yes, that's, you know, that, that's crucial. Uh, and inclusivity, uh, a really showing that everybody's one right and um uh, that's that's the main point and somebody with integrity obviously major major importance um and so somebody there's a very nice word in dutch which is uh, it's literally human it's called mens but the way it's said it's written in dutch usually it's M-E-N-S, which is just human. But then when I'm talking about this expression in this setting, it's with S-C-H in the end, which means literally human, as in humanism, you know, as in really caring for others, as really serving, you know, for the best. And everything is tailor-made in, in any difference, you know, in, in any situation. Um, I do also believe that a very strong uh, psychological and spiritual backbone in terms of knowledge, basic principles on, you know, empowerment, on, um, uh, you know, whatever it may be, that is definitely of a lot of, you know, it's very, very valuable. Um, possibly even more than whatever religious works that we do have, which, you know, also showcase those principles, obviously, but it's much more about how do we translate in the here and now? What can we do with it? You know, how can we literally connect and also connect with the CEO and other stakeholders that are relevant to this whole package? Um, and, and you know, because in e literally every situation that we have every single day, it doesn't matter what level within an organization, it doesn't matter, it can be at home as well. We're literally challenged to come up with the best of ourselves. And also we're each other's students and we, we're each other's um, uh, teachers, right? So every single situation is different and every single, single situation is an opportunity. Um, so what a chief spiritual officer does in the end is connection, 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 all of that absolutely EQ that we talked about it, but then also facilitating, making the space non judgmental. You, we're here to serve, we're here to bring us the best, we're here to find solutions, we're here to heal. And healing, it happens when there is a deep connection within, within between people. It doesn't matter what the situation is, it doesn't even have to be the most profound you know, a psychological tool or method, you know, obviously these things help a lot, but the only thing that we want as human beings is we want to be seen, literally understood, seen for who we are, seen for what we're going through, seen for whatever is happening. And if a chief spiritual officer is able to do so, to really see what is necessary without, it doesn't matter what, you know, whatever, uh, 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 you know, dimension we're talking about, and then also being able to see those stakeholders, to really connect with them in order to evolve, in order to, um, you know, provide the best care, the best solutions and whatsoever, you know, that's what we're going for. You know, there's a, uh, a concept of, of what we do uh, in chaplaincy and it, it's, it's attending to spiritually sensitive tissue when we engage with humans, right? And so the brain, is that muscle and there, there is no more powerful muscle in the body than the brain and so a comment was made by uh jess o'conn on the chat and he says cso should be able to work with the clinical psychologist interchangeably collaborating together will give a more effective level of service for clients and and now including the c cwo this this gives total healthcare mind body and soul and so we you know all of this all of that has been spoken is is ideal it's it's about taking what we do expanding it at a leadership level but now 
let, let's go a little bit further. How does this somehow, how do we balance both being that, that leader, that, that policy influencer and supporting the chaplains, the hospice chaplains in the field? How do we do that? What does that look like? What, what do you think, Dina Pearl? Honestly, I think it, um, it can be a tough job because it's, you know, taking on different roles and different interests, which means sometimes, you know, fighting the good fight, right? Um, uh, taking a stand, uh, being, being strong when it comes to being decisive, right? In, in making choices. Um, so that's something that I would say in, in a general, let's say, uh, you know, from a general overview. Um, if you mean it in a different way, tell me and I can, I can jump in. Well, n no, that, that is one way. But again, it, there's a fluid aspect of this, right? Because we are talking about spiritual practice and how, that, how one defines spirituality requires understanding that one person, right? And so we're applying spirituality, spiritual care delivery to leadership as a CSO. We're ministering to those that are sitting at the table, but simultaneously turning to and, and, and having a pulse for what Kenneth would call the troops in the field, right? And yeah. being, able to, being able to massage having that pulse and then translating it at another level, right? So, so what I'm getting to, the point I'm getting to is how should the CSO advocate for hospice chaplains in that regard? and still maintain the identity of a spiritual caregiver. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Well, it, it, then I'm, I'm coming back to the answer that I gave you. Indeed, it's, it's literally fighting a good fight. And then also knowing how to deal with those different stakeholders, knowing what to do in what situation. And honestly, in the end, this has mostly to do with communication. Um, it has to do with knowing when to be, you know, in in this open and service mode from, you know, a chief spiritual officer, you know, place and, and a connection place. And we should always be connected also in a more, let's say, factual setting. But it's a different way of connecting. Sometimes it requires something different. It, sometimes it does require, you know, more IQ. Sometimes it requires, uh, uh, you know, having a, a very strong discussion about something and being, you know, uh, very, you know, stand, uh, but let's say, uh, how do you say it in English? All right, like very, this is very, this is this is what you know the ground that I'm standing on. This is the point that I really want to make in order to create some space. This is literally nothing different from um, any other uh, stakeholder communication that you would, you could you know come up with. It's it's the same in in it's, it's literally you know knowing how to. Uh, uh, be a leader in, in that situation. I think that, you know, should sum up basically uh, everything that we're talking about, being a leader, knowing how to do this, knowing how to uh, have these, uh, these, these conversations. So Charles, I, I like to just uh, chime in and just say that uh, one thing that the uh, CSO should, uh, you know, look at are, are the type of chaplains that they're going to employ uh, just because they are a religious leader does not, to me, mean that they should be a chaplain. I think there's a particular uh, skill set and attitude um, that comes along with being a chaplain. And I remember uh, joining the Air Force in my interview uh, with the wing chaplain at, at my base. Uh, he, he told me, he said, are you going to be able to work more than one day a week? And I was, didn't understand the question, but what he wanted to say is, hey, Sunday is Sunday, but what about Monday through Saturday? What are you going to be able to else to provide to these men and women? Um, you know, they're not always going to need a sermon, but they're going to they're going to need you to uh, pour into their lives. They're going to need you to listen. They're going to need you to be able to be objectionable and just sit there uh, and be available and be present in their lives. And, and I think oftentimes that's where many of our fellow chaplains struggle is because there's the urge to go back into their parochial or their parish ministry setting and realize that as a chaplain, that that's not always the first call. Uh, I have to be able to have more skills in my bag 
um, than just my religious training. I got to be able to, uh, you know, as you said, uh, uh, Dean, I got to be able to look at some of the um, human aspects, humanism and psychological aspects and be able to really expand my view on spirituality and not just saying that it's really linked uh, to a faith. Uh, and, I, and I think the, so it's going to really start with the people. And, and having an expectation, just saying, you know what, just because they have a religious background, a religious leader, does not mean that they're going to be the best person to be a chaplain, or they're going to be able to know when to use their spiritual beliefs and when to pull those beliefs back. Or are they going to be able to, remember, some people can't actually share uh, and, and work with other people based on the fact that they're their doctrinal beliefs are so pressing and so forward in their lives, they shut down everything else. So that type of person would would not make a, a great chaplain uh, uh, to me. And, and so that the CSO is 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 really trying to uh, set the front, uh, the groundwork on what those who are out there in the field are supposed to be doing it. And I think the best way we do that, uh, we have to have education. We, we're going to have to be the educators uh, for uh, upper leadership, the C-suite. This is what we're, we're doing. This is where we would love to grow and, and move our, our people into, uh, especially you know, as being uh, patient advocates, uh, being employee advocates, being an advocate for the organization. These are things that I feel that the chaplain would be so suited for. Uh, and an and, and, and organization needs advocates. Many, uh, I mean, there are uh, employees and I've worked in secular organizations and we had a, a, a gentleman, he was an employee relations specialist, but basically his job was to be a marketplace chaplain and he had a, a, a pastoral background uh, and he was going around to just see how people are and were there things that were uh, that they felt that senior leaders could do better at? Did they feel like their their, their work was being appreciated? Because um, for for any organization, human capital is, is going to be your greatest asset in your organization. People, uh, organizations spend thousands and thousands of dollars on training uh, employees and to say that you have invested all of that resource and financial capital into someone then they walk out on you in a month or two months over something that could have easily been settled so i think those are that's a great way that we can make inroads to really growing the cso position Oh, I love that. I love that. Mm. Indeed, the training and then investing in somebody and it could have been checked much earlier in the process. I, I 100% agree with that. And also, Ken, what I also, uh, you remind me of something. Uh, it reminds me of the work of Ken Wilber, who is, you know, a very famous American philosopher. And he talks about an integrated society, how to integrate every single aspect that we have, everyone. I think he is you know, his theory is phenomenal. And he talks about, for example, the distinction between waking up and growing up. And there are different categories as well, but waking up and growing up. And I love this because, you know, there are some people that are really great when it comes to theory, that are great when it comes to, you know, a, a spiritual works or even religious works whatsoever. They know a lot. But when it comes to EQ, right, to connecting and to really leading by example, right, it's a total failure, right? It's as if they're so great at their knowledge, but they're still not, they're not grown up as a, as a human being, right? There's a big, big difference. So growing up means literally developing yourself as a human being, right? So uh, uh, literally maturing and in every single uh, area, right? And then waking up is a different aspect. Waking up is literally the spiritual journey, the awareness, right? The higher consciousness, the better self of you, right? There are different um, synonyms for the same phenomenon, but it's, it's literally your spiritual journey to expanding the awareness and to be able to serve from that place. So there's such a big difference between indeed the theory and the, and the practice, right? And we need, as in, uh, right, the chief spiritual officers need to be a combination of those two and not excluding one or the other. So there's a point of clarification um, that comes from Hamish. Um, and, the, and the question is, Kenneth, are you saying that the CSO does not need to be a chaplain? Uh, no, I, I'm not saying that the CSO uh, should not be a chaplain, but I think the CSO should uh, be able to define 
what the chaplain is in their organization and, and not be relegated to just uh, religious leaders or faith leaders uh, in the community. I think that's, that's a part of who we are, but I think that's just only half. You know, our, our better, our, that's our better half, but we still have another half that has to be uh, also utilized within uh, our work. And I think we're diminishing what we do, only just relegating our role to just being religious or faith-based leaders. We have to bring more to the table um, because we are dealing uh, with people who are, who are looking at, hey, what else can you do? We, we, we can go get that. Uh, and for a lot of healthcare systems, they have gotten, they have, they've done away with their chaplaincy departments, their pastoral mm -hmm. care departments. And they're just, they're just depending on volunteers, especially if they live in a part of the country where, where there's strong faith and religious communities, they just outsource it. But, and I, and I think that's a bad, that's a bad trend uh, because again, uh, many of these uh, leaders do not possess the skill set that is required to be able to perform care within the clinical setting. If I could just jump in and, and add as well, I think it's really important, you know, you, you've made some really good points, and I think it's important for us to utilize the language of not functioning in a silo, because that's what in, that what ends up happening is there, there becomes this siloed mentality where, okay, so now that I have a seat at the table, this is the only area that I am uh, responsible for. This is the only area of influence that I have, and it has to be far-reaching. It has to be integrated. It has to be connected. And then also, um, I love what both of you said in terms of leading by example. And to me, that also means that we're having one-on-ones with our staff. We are having that opportunity where they can have a forum with that chief spiritual officer to say, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. This is what I see in my day-to-day -day work. And so there's that opportunity for exchange. There's that opportunity. And then that chief spiritual officer brings that to the leadership table and says, not only is this what I'm seeing in my seat, but the chaplains who are on the front lines or the people who are you know, involved and engaged in this process are seeing these things and these are the areas that we need to work toward change or these are the areas that we need to work toward having more resources or additional education, training. How can we work together as a leadership team to ensure that all of the needs are being met and it's not just dependent on the chief spiritual officer, well, they're chaplains or they're spiritual caregivers, so that's your responsibility. No, it's all of us together, and that chief spiritual officer is a crucial part of that process. Yeah, well said. Well said. You know, we're we're uh, we're just past uh, two o'clock Central Time, um, but I do want to. I did post this out on the chat. You know, I'm really encouraging uh, you know attendees. You know, ask some questions. You know, that that's what this is all about. Uh, we have a really good discussion, um, and I know that there's different perspectives all across the board um, and expertise. And so this conversation should not just end here in, in this block of time. It needs to be had across the board. Um, there was a statement made earlier, a comment made by Dr. Anthony that, that was interesting. Spirituality must be the focus that leads to wellness. The healing process must be an outdoor uh, and the steps to reaching the best overall goals of wholeness. Um, I agree, um, but at the same time, I would, I would probably push back and say this, in order to get that, you, you, the spirituality has to be defined. And, and, and ultimately the organization has to be looked at, the leadership and the organization has to be looked at as, as like, much like a patient and, and seeking to explore how that organization defines spirituality. What is the culture that that organization is is plotting, and then be able to be flexible and fluid enough in order to to get there. I think I think there's more to that. Um, I want to a little bit slightly as uh, hopefully make it some room for more questions. But the issue of uh, you know policy, procedure, and supervision, we kind of we kind of glanced over it a little bit, right? Um, and, you know, again, CMS driving force. 
one of the things that has come up here recently is concerns about uh, uh, bereavement practices towards you know you know once a once a patient is approaching end of life, um, will a chaplain uh, is a chaplain required to to visit within that certain time frame that was tasked? And it was initially three days, and then moved to seven days, and now it's not required. And so. Um, I wonder if you all can kind of speak on that. Like, do you foresee the CSO being able to be an influencer in that regard? And and who would they influence? Who would they be be able to talk to in that regard um, as far as uh, areas of CSO focus and, and push? What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely, positively. I think that there's um, much uh, opportunity to influence that particular area. And I think it's important to, again, looking at that collaborative effort, not functioning in a silo and being able to say, this is best practice. And so even if this is not a CMS regulation or guideline, this is how we will choose to govern ourselves as yeah. an organization, as a provider because it's what is the right thing to do. This will enhance the care that we are providing. This will allow us to continue to be skilled uh, at the work that we do and kind of looking at um, scope of practice in that as well. What does that look like? What does that mean? So, you know, we all know that, you know, with the different disciplines that are represented throughout hospice, there are over there is overlap, you know, in a lot of the things that we um, do and provide, you know, emotional support, you know, any number of different um, areas. And so it's important for the CSO to be able to look at sort of the whole picture and what are those areas of importance to this organization? What do we think is best practice for our chaplains and for our team uh, as a whole? And again, you're doing this in conjunction with other leaders and so it isn't, well, there's a CSO trying to go rogue or there's a CSO trying to push through, you know, X, Y, and Z, because if there's no buy-in, then it's only going to go so far. And so it's really important to make sure that people have a solid knowledge and understanding of what these things are. I mean, obviously, we're going to follow CMS guidelines, you know, to the T, but are there things that we can do that go above and beyond that? that will allow us to, again, provide excellent care because it's the right thing to do for these patients and families and not so much worry about, well, you know, do we need to do this? Do we need to do that just because? No, we, we want to be intentional and we want to be focused. And so looking at that scope of practice, looking at the skills that are required, and then looking at policy procedure, you know, are there things that we need to do to enhance uh, what we already do and the guidelines that we follow. Oh, that's really wonderful, Brendan. And you provide an opportunity also for me to say something about this and zoom out a bit um, and also out of the, let's say, the hospice setting or, you know, obviously what we're talking about, but much more towards other organizations, for example, the business world. So if you would look at such a setting, what you could see is that um, what a chief spiritual officer would do and what a human resource department would do could also, you know, be intertwined or could, you know, clash in some areas or could, you know, uh, uh, strengthen. It really depends on. But those are also the conversations that need to take place. And I think it's maybe it's an assumption. I'm not sure, obviously, but I have the feeling that when it comes to being open to the true definition of a chief spiritual officer, especially in the business world, that the US is even further than, for example, the Netherlands. Uh, again, you know, like I said before, whenever people hear, even hear the term spirituality in the business world, they run away. They think, why should, you know, that be part of uh, my uh, literary work life? Um, and then again, there's, a, you know, luckily a lot of awareness right now uh, by a big majority of people who are seeking for spirituality new generations that are coming up that are you know uh, uh, hunger had to have this hunger for it and the need for it and that they say and they say it so eloquently they say when i work my transitions in life do not stop and i bring myself to my work 
everything that I am, all my experiences, all my background, everything that I own. And it's not that a part of it will be, for example, left at home and then I'm you know, going to the office and okay, well, I'm this, this person. Obviously, we're, if we're talking about specific roles, there is sometimes you know a big distinction between private and 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 you know the working environment that's different but that's on the role right on the, on the level of the role but not on the human being you bring everything that you are everything that you want um and i do believe i'm gonna take this one step further and i know we're you know having a sort of zoom out here but i think that the organization of the near future should not be top down as in an organization to make profit only as in an organization that is very traditional in that sense but it should be much more an organization that facilitates personal growth and whatever that personal growth may be right and every single human being in the world is going through phases of personal growth it's an ongoing right? It's an ongoing path. It's part of life. If there's no personal growth, if there are no wishes, then we're not even living. So that's literally in, let's say, in the setting of other organizations. Then coming back to what we're talking about more specifically, yes, do not silo it. Do the right thing. That's the most important thing. You will know in, in the situation itself what is the right thing. And then what are we talking about? In the end, we're talking about personal growth that's it literally it's it's that's the definition personal growth in whatever form that may be well said well said um we have a question from uh saul abima um saul says great job to all of you for making this a great conversation one point of clarification is the cso supposed to be a new name for the for chaplain or a separate position within the hospice agency. Would any of you like to speak to that? <laughs> so the connection was really bad. So can you repeat it? Uh, Sorry, one more time. Uh, is the CSO supposed to be a new name for a chaplain or a separate position within the hospice agency? Mm. So okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and venture. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> You can go. <laughs> <laughs> so I would I would venture to say that it would be a new position within the hospice context um, because there is the work of the chaplain that has to be done, and there's nothing that says that that CSO cannot go out in the field and do that work of a chaplain. But there needs to be a difference in separation, and the reason I say that is until the mindset of organizations in general change, that CSO will always be minimized and, and, you know, and, so, and reduced. And I'm not saying that the, the role of the chaplain is, is lower than anything else, but if the CSO is supposed to have a leadership role, oftentimes what will happen is, well, if there's a shortage, oh, well, the CSO can go out in the field and handle that. And so there's that balance of, well, yeah, that can happen, but are we doing everything that we need to do to ensure that that CSO can still maintain that leadership, that responsibility, or do they get bogged down and are unable to fulfill those leadership uh, responsibilities because they have to see patients and they have to take on, you know, a caseload that a chaplain would occupy. And so I think you have to have them both so that there is that ebb and flow and there is that creativity. And again, having those one-on-ones with the chaplains on the front lines and translating that information and translating that data as a member of the leadership team as well. Okay, so, so Leroy, Leroy Scott, he made a statement. I pushed back and asked if this was a question, but um, I guess I can reframe it into a question. The statement is sounds like a, a big title with no extra money. So I guess, <laughs> do you do you foresee um, that title coinciding with a, a pay increase, or is that just you know a special duty type deal? What do you, what do you think? It would have to be it would have to be an increase. Uh, in my estimation, it needs to be on par with other members of the C suite. It 
it isn't a yep. sort of honorific sort of title where, you know, we just kind of change the title of chaplain to this. Um, that does not honor the tradition of chaplaincy, and it does not honor the tradition of business as well. That is not doing good business at its, at its base, um, baseline. And so it is important to understand the distinction. Uh, and if we are to be respected on that level and given so this title, then there also needs to be the compensation that goes along with that and the responsibility that goes along with that. So again, you know, we can't have it, you know, both ways. We have to understand that with that C in front of it, that if there's a, a big pay increase, there's also a responsibility increase as well. And so it shouldn't be, uh, well, we'll just, we'll just change the title and, and, you know, you kind of function in that way. It has to be a, a very clear distinction. And, and to be honest with you, I think that, that is a, that's an entirely different conversation that we can probably have, you know, oh, yeah. because, you know, anything dealing with money in any organization, in any discipline, is, it comes with its own justifications and, and maneuvering through. So we're, we're, we're getting really short on time. And, and I'm, I am appreciating the, 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 the question and, and the dialogue. Um, I want to, you know, kind of before we close out, kind of see, um, you know, because it looks like we're, we're all coming kind of towards the end of this discussion time. Are there any final comments um, from you all as panel members before we kind of close this out? I'll start with, uh, I'll start with you, Dina Perla. Yes, well, I was still thinking about the last topic about about money and about, you know, maturing, right, maturing the role and not uh, a giving a title of a chief spiritual officer and then, for example, do uh, it on another level or something more uh, practical, which is uh, another way to go. For example, even if we would zoom out again to other business uh, organization, uh, have somebody just do recruitment and human resources. That's a big difference, right? Um, um, so I was thinking about that. And basically, to bring it a bit of sort of full circle, a uh, so full cycle, uh, it, it comes back to what we discussed earlier about, you know, uh, telling those stories and also showing the data, both, right? So quantitative and qualitative. Being um, uh, in, in the field, educating, and also in the end, making sure that chief spiritual officers are taken seriously. And that have, you know, it, it's, it's a way to go, and it's something that needs to happen. And, you know, I would love to see some major steps uh, uh, coming out of, you know, these sort of discussions that we're having right now and, and obviously, you know, lobbying, uh, speaking to uh, decision makers, uh, writing about it and so on and so forth. So we need to uh, continue this constructive, uh, uh, you know, conversation publicly and continue advocating for it. And then, you know, also giving some proof points to make sure that the whole idea and, and implementation of chief spiritual officers will mature, no matter what country, uh, what uh, a vertical we're talking about, uh, and maybe even more in the verticals that we're talking about today. Okay. Uh, uh, Charles, certainly thank you for uh, the invitation to be on this uh, discussion panel today. Uh, in, in my in my military career, uh, I have seen the example of the chief spiritual officer in the in the Air Force. Uh, he's called the chief of chaplains. Uh, he is a two star general who reports to the four star general, who is the chief of staff of the Air Force. Uh, and, and General Shikes, um, who is from the PCUSA, uh, Brandon, uh, one, one of your guys. Um, you know, he he is responsible for all spiritual care. And so he, he, he works on that strategic level. And then those are under him who are on major commands uh, in the military. The Air Force has 10 major commands. Uh, you have operational leaders. And then you have those at the bottom that are tactical. Uh, I, I would think that I wouldn't want someone to say it's a fancy title that doesn't really have any merit. Uh, to it. it. It certainly is needed because other organizations like the military have had chief spiritual officers and they continue to grow. Uh, if you are an office or a shop of one, then by default, you might as well consider yourself the chief spiritual officer, but, but expand that role, make sure 
that you're just not the chief spiritual officer just in name only by only doing the tactical things, the things that's at the bottom level, but also doing the planning, uh, advocating. Uh, you're going before uh, your your those those CEOs of that C-suite, whoever that might be in your organizational structure, and saying, "This is what I would like to see happen." or the chapels, and this is where I like to see spiritual care grow. That is what the uh, CSO is going to be looking like in an organization. And even if you're in an organization where you're the only chaplain, you can still be that person who is advocating on the behalf of our discipline. That's, that's terrific, that's terrific. Um, I too wanna to just express uh, my gratitude for the opportunity to participate in today's panel discussion. I think this has been amazing and a, a great opportunity for um, discussion and dialogue. The only thing that I would add at this particular point is as we educate and advocate um, that we do it with compassion and collaboration and not out of anger and frustration um, because oftentimes we are jumping up and down and we're angry. But if we, if we approach it with compassion and collaboration, I think that may help influence change a little bit better than anger and frustration. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. All right. So, wow, this has been time well spent. And I'd like <laughs> to thank our distinguished panel members, uh, Dina Perla Portner, Reverend C. Brandon Brewer, and Captain Kenneth Thomas Jr. for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate today and provide your knowledge and wisdom to this discussion. Also, thank you again to those that joined us today and submitted questions and comments. Um, it's my hope that not only will this discussion continue, but that action will be taken for the benefit of those we serve in the hospice and palliative care community. Um, if, if by any chance, um, you have questions, concerns, comments, uh, free, feel free to utilize the contact information that I just posted in the chat box. Um, so in parting, let me say this, may peace be with you and may you impart that peace to others. Take care everybody, thank you for coming.